attached to this word and that it will live forever because you've discovered something eternal and immutable is too much something that, it's something that scientists cannot resist to this day. So this is where philosophers become absolutely necessary to correct this problem. Now, think about it. Scientists were deeply religious. Galileo remained religious despite the fact that the religious authorities had confined him to his house for the rest of his life. He that did not uh, uh, did anything in, in terms of his, his deep religious beliefs. Scientists in the 18, 17 and 18th centuries, from Newton to Euler to Lagrange, were deeply religious. It was only when science became professional, as I was saying before, when, the, when science as a career stabilized, and stabilized because of industry, the beer industry for fermentation, uh, the textile industry for pigments, the, the machine industry for thermodynamics, because they were creating better and better, more and more efficient steam engines, and they needed science like James Watt to come in and make analysis of what, how exactly can we improve this design. Industry was what liberated eventually science from its a, 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 a religiosity, but to this day, I've heard, I've seen polls, one conducted in 1917 and the other one conducted in 1971, in which the question was, do you believe in a God that answers prayer? This, the last part of the question was important, because you can believe in a God that, uh, that the one we talk, we're going to talk about tonight when we come back, that is impersonal and imminent, and a, a God that is impersonal doesn't answer prayer, doesn't even know what prayer is, and doesn't even know what answering anything is. It's, it's absolutely non-human. It's the opposite. It's, 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 it's the ultimate in non in, be, in the becoming non-human. But if you believe in a sign in a God that answers prayer, then you believe in a humanoid God, just like the God of the Bible. And believe it or not, something like thirty percent of scientists in both polls, 1917 and 1971, answer yes. I do believe in a God that answers prayer, which means that religion has not left science. And the concept of a law comes directly from that religious background. Is what I would call, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna write here because I'm gonna need the space, a theological fossil. It's something that began in the 16th century, law talk, that then you establish itself because of the prestige of attaching your name to the word, but that also kind of kept the subterranean religious feelings of at least 30% of scientists who think that, they, that God wrote the laws of the world in the language of mathematics. They discovered, following the Greeks and, 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 and the Muslims, who invented algebra, and of course the, 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 the Indians who invented zero and, and created a complete system of numbers, they followed that tradition because it was the language that God had used. I believe Galileo was the one with that expression. We're discovering the laws of, of, of God that were written in the language of mathematics. So, theology never completely left science. Today, the only scientists that are, that are, that are hardcore atheists belong to the royal societies. They are the most prestigious scientists. But your garden variety scientists still believe in the, in the concept of law. Now, I don't like that concept. I think it's theological. Or rather, I don't like that word. But I do believe in the content of laws. For instance, when talking about the law of gravity, I do believe that it is beyond any reasonable doubt today that two bodies attract each other in direct proportion to the product of their masses and in direct proportion to the square of their distance. That's the law of gravity. You know, the, the more massive two bodies are, the more gravity they have and the more they attract each other and the farther away two bodies are, the less they attract each other. So, the pattern, two bodies attract each other in direct proportion to the product of their masses and in direct proportion to the square of their distance is true. I, just have, I don't have any doubts about that. We might perfect it. You know, today, for instance, uh, there is a search for this mysterious entity called dark matter, which is sort of like matter, only it breathes like this. 
<laughs> you know, it's matter that went to the dark side of the force. <laughs> and it's supposed to be 90% of the matter of the universe. Now, the first time I read about that, it's like, I'm going, 90% of the matter of the universe is missing? Shouldn't someone get fired of this? <laughs> I mean, you know, you guys are in charge of the matter of the universe. <laughs> We just checked, and 90% is missing. Someone is gonna get fired, man. At least 10 physicists should like get their asses fired out of here. Come on, you lost 90%. Where did you, how did you lose it? Well, that has to do with the fact that given the law of gravity as we have it, there doesn't seem to be enough matter in the universe. So they're postulating this mysterious thing called dark matter. I don't believe in dark matter, okay? I believe in oxygen, because that is a 200-year-old entity that has now been tr treated and, 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 and experimented with and, 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 and done so many things with in 200 years that it would be almost impossible that oxygen turn out not to exist. But dark matter, hey, I reserve judgment about that. You know, I'll believe it when I see it. You know, like 30 years from now, you know, oh, we finally have some dark matter here. You want to see it? Well, it's way too dark, man. I can't see anything. Well, it's because it's dark matter. I don't believe in dark matter. And I know that making a few changes to the law of gravity, to the equation of gravity, would get rid of dark matter. So if they ask me, which never, they will never do, but if they did, I would say, change the equation, man. Don't postulate that 90% of the universe is supposed to be filled with this stuff that we don't even know what it is, right? Nevertheless, leaving that aside, I do believe that the law of gravity captures a pattern. Captures what we might call an imminent pattern of becoming. An imminent pattern of change. So, what I'm saying here now is we have to get rid of the word not of the referent of the word. Now, if you are not a materialist, say if you're an idealist like Baudrillard, then there is no, there is no referent to the word. So Baudrillard became famous by denying that there was any referent to the word. Everything is a simulacrum, everything is just free floating signifiers, so if you get rid of the word, <coughs> you get rid of the referent. But hopefully, everybody's playing ball here, and no one is being a Baudrillardian, and so we are not going to confuse words with the reference. You can get rid of a word, and you can keep the reference. I do believe that scientists of the last 400 years have discovered a whole variety of imminent patterns of becoming. What gives regularity to the world, what gives order to the world, what makes the world not be some chaotic gas in which no order can be discerned. There's clearly certain regularities, regularities in crystals, regularities in, in, in genes, regularities in plants and animals, regularities in the way that mountains form, regularities in the type of clouds that form, regularities in the type of solar systems, and so on and so forth. What I disagree with is that the best way of dealing with imminent patterns of becoming is by using some goofy theological fossil. And the Lewis agrees with me. In <laughs> Or rather, I took this from the list. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, the Luz never even heard my name, so how could they possibly agree? Uh, in nomadology, there is a very famous quote, and unfortunately I don't have it with me, where he says, very specifically, we need to get rid of the concept of law. But we, don't get, we, we don't need to get rid of the referent of the word law. What we need is new concepts, new philosophical concepts that capture these patterns of becoming without using this word. And he proposes two concepts. One is singularities. In that quote, this is what I myself call tendencies. Because I think it's clear. And 